All right. Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I don't know when this decided to uh, start working on the on the uh, on YouTube itself, but okay, we're here. Technical difficulties. One of these days, we'll get on the stream on time. So welcome everybody. Um, be sure to like this video if you haven't already. Subscribe to the channel. Tonight we are doing an an expose, if you will, on the yoga practice. So my two guests tonight are um, just as educated on this topic, if not more, as I am. My friend Nayla is an ex yoga teacher and our brother in Christ. Brian, he is a demonologist and he does full-time ministry. He really focuses on casting out demons and healing. He's awesome. He's actually, both of them have been on my show before, so you'll recognize their faces. But tonight we wanted to just kind of dig into this discussion on yoga because um, it's a huge issue, not only in the new age community, but unfortunately in the church as well. So my prayer with this video was that I want this to be the resource that you're sending your friends and family that think yoga is just innocuous stretching or don't see it as a big deal or maybe don't really know much about it at all and want to learn more. So that being said, I'm going to bring my two guests on. All right. Hey, guys, how are you? Great. Hi. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so we're going to start uh -huh. just by each giving like a two, three minute testimony of, you know, why we quote unquote, have any authority at all to speak about yoga. I'll go first, then I'll pass it to Nayla and then Brian. So for those of you that don't know, I was in new age for almost a decade. I was a yoga teacher. I was teaching in person and online. And then in 2021, Jesus saved me from the deception of new age. I used to be one of those people that thought it was totally ridiculous to call anything demonic, let alone yoga, which was at the time really my life. It was my healing practice. It was my daily routine. And I truly believed that it was helping me, but that's because the Bible says that, you know, Satan blinds the minds of unbelievers. And I was blind at the time. And it was only by the grace of Jesus Christ that he actually removed those scales and gave me the eyes to see. And so we just pray today that you will have those same eyes to see and a heart to receive the truth as well. So that's a little bit about me. Nayla, how about you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was raised up uh, by witches in the occult. And so I grew up around um, witchcraft my whole life. And yoga was like the gateway drug for me into deeper occultic practices for myself. Like that was what initiated me into the dark arts. And how I eventually ended up in witchcraft was because I started doing yoga. Um, I became a yoga teacher and I specialized in um, sound healing and chanting and different forms of um sound yoga if you will and that led me to tantra and that led me to blood magic and i eventually became a blood witch which was kind of my niche in new age so i taught yoga for the best part of 10 years and absolutely loved yoga i was obsessed with it i thought it was my salvation at the mm -hmm. time um because i hadn't met the, the the only one who can give salvation jesus christ and so at the time it was like this is it. It promises me I'm going to be healed and I'm going to be saved and I'm going to have inner peace, which is what I was looking for. Um, but yeah, it's a massive deception. So I'm really excited that we can just expose that tonight. Awesome. And Brian, awesome. I don't know if you really practiced yoga, but I know you've mm -hmm. studied a lot mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. Um, it wasn't something that I like super study or I, something that I super was involved in, but it was something that when my life um, as a child, I, I saw some something demonic. I was very scientifically driven, but you know, I saw something that I couldn't explain and it kind of opened up my mind to the reality that the spiritual world was, was something that was real. I thought it was all fake, you know, um, for the majority of my life, but then I spent my whole life studying demonology kind of like as a hobby. Um, and I thought, um, it would be fun to learn about demons. And I thought of it as make believe and stories. And I studied history and ancient religions and occult stuff. And I got into a bunch of knowledge until um, I started living in a very sort of worldly lifestyle. And I had, um, I had girlfriends that were involved in, in yoga and these kind of practices. So I was around the whole new age environment quite a bit, actually. I had good friends that were yoga instructors. And, uh, you know, th this was something that I kind of hung around in that environment. And then, you know, one of the people, one of my girlfriend that at the time got possessed by something demonic, I didn't even think it was real. 
um, until I saw the, the reactions in her body, which was like, just something I've never, you know, I'd known this girl for years and I'd never seen anything like that. But then the Lord just kind of woke me up and she ended up, God pulled me out of all this lifestyle, like immediately in, in a more, very miraculous way. And, uh, that, that opened my eyes to the truth. And then God basically took all my esoteric knowledge and all this stuff that I studied about demons my whole life and goes, Hey, guess what? You thought that was for, for funsies. No, that was for this. <laughs> then he just started like giving me the actual understanding of real demons. My whole world went from like, I thought this was fairy tales to all of a sudden, boom, now I deal with it every day. Like I literally cast demons out of people and heal people and deal with crazy. I just prayed the demon of Shiva, ironically, off of somebody that, that just happened, like not even a few days ago. And it was, it was a gnarly experience. And it's obviously the Lord driving this situation, uh, preparing to talk about the spiritual aspect. And I operate in spiritual gifts and, you know, kind of, uh, like study ancient history. So yeah, (laughs) that's my, that's my story. Yeah. Amen. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. cause it's it's the same for all three of us. All three of our testimonies are Mm -hmm. so different, but it's the same premise that what the enemy meant for good, God turned around to use for our good and for his glory ultimately. So, you know, Mm -hmm. I feel the same way Mm -hmm. about astrology and yoga too. And I know Naley, you do as well, that all this stuff that we learned in the new age, it wasn't for nothing ultimately. Like God allowed us to go down such dark paths because he knew one day that we would be preaching the light. (laughs) So praise God. Um, All right, y'all, let's get into it. Uh, Let's see where this conversation goes. Everyone, we wanna start by talking a little bit about like the history of yoga um, and maybe the design of yoga, the definition of yoga. I got it, Mike, I fix it. My audio was low. Um, Okay, so let's get into it. So the word yoga, for those that don't know, is derived from the Sanskrit root, which means yuj, and it's to join or to yoke or to unite. So we talk about this all the time when we're trying to explain to people why yoga is so much more than just stretching. Yoga by definition in and of itself literally means to unite. So what are we uniting with? Well, per the yogic scriptures, the practice of yoga actually leads to the union of individual consciousness with universal consciousness, otherwise known as source, otherwise otherwise known as God. However, it's important to note that this is not the God of the Bible, okay? But with this union, it is intended to create a perfect harmony between the practitioner's mind body and soul it's the um marriage of man and nature essentially and it's based on the belief ultimately that everything is just a manifestation of the same quantum source so it's oneness right and the goal of yoga really is to experience that oneness to get yourself back to source and if you're a christian you already know what this sounds like right because what is the gospel the gospel is reconciliation through jesus christ back to god okay so the yoga practice is to lead the yogi to attain a state of freedom which they refer to as nirvana or as moksha. So it's all about self-realization. And the self-realization is to overcome suffering. Um, And it leads to, again, that moksha, which they call a state of liberation. And so therefore the the practitioner will live in quote unquote freedom in all walks of their life, in health, in um, a physical and mental variety, in spiritual health, in harmony, And so it's really just about this yoking, this yoking to higher consciousness. Now, I want to start off by saying off the bat that does this seem innocuous on a surface level? Yes. If you are somebody who has no further context on the yoga practice, or if you're a new Christian and you hear someone say, okay, well, the point of yoga is to actually join you to God. What's so bad about that? So the, see, I want you to understand from the get-go that this is how the devil works, okay? He is crafty. He is cunning. The Bible says that we are to be vigilant to the wiles of the devil so that he does not take advantage of us. And so as we learn more about yoga, you, you begin to understand that this is very different. 
from just your normal exercise routine, which I know a lot of people do use it for. You may think this doesn't even apply to you because that's how you're using the yoga practice. But the thing about that is you have to understand that the yoga practice was never actually intended to be a physical exercise, okay? It has always been a spiritual exercise in which the physical body is used to be the modality in order to perform and achieve the spiritual goal. And so regardless of how you're using yoga or what you think it is, this is what the yoga practice actually is. It is a spiritual practice using the physical modality, okay? And yoga is believed to have started at the dawn of civilization. We're going to kind of get into that a little bit when Brian gets into the history that he's compiled on the yoga practice. Um, and it ties into the yogic lore here where Shiva, okay, so again, back to union with God, you have to understand that in this culture, in this Hindu culture, Shiva is kind of, and Brahmin are like the, the big top tier gods. And Shiva particularly is the patron god of yoga. He is seen in the lore as the first yogi. And the story goes that he poured his profound yogic knowledge onto the quote seven sages otherwise known as the sons of god uh lowercase g god and that powerful yoga practice was therefore carried through different parts of the world asia middle east north africa south america and when you find the um archaeological evidence of this you see that the scholars have found really similar parallels between the ancient cultures across the globe which kind of lends to the um legitimacy of the lore which again brian's going to elaborate on how it's actually legitimate in just a moment but overall it is wildly just known that india is ultimately the starting the birthing place of the yoga practice um i do have another video on my channel that i recorded a long time ago called the truth about yoga where i do get into this a little bit deeper if you're interested in more moving on from the history the word yoga again means union and this is all written about in the bhagavad gita which i'm probably mispronouncing i haven't looked at that scripture in a really long time but basically that's like a it's a hindu version of our our bible okay and then as like a supplemental text to that, you have Pantajali's Yoga Sutras, right? So both of these ancient yogi scriptures or Hindu scriptures discuss the yoga practice. And it's known that the yoga practice, again, is to achieve moksha. Another word would be samadhi, which is where you're connecting with the God, with the God source, with the divine. And so... The patron god here is Shiva again, and he is uh, a Hindu god, y'all. So he's a lowercase g god. And the reason why you are to yoke with Shiva, particularly in the yoga practice, is because you're essentially praying to him that you're, when you use your body in the yoga practice, it's through prayer. You are praying to Shiva, you are paying homage to Shiva. In an, in an attempt to yoke with Shiva because you are one universal consciousness. We can talk another time about um, all this sort of contradictory paradoxes within these religious worldviews, but that's a discussion for another time. The point is that the asanas, the yoga postures, the vinyasas, they were all created to focus on Shiva. Ultimately, they're not simply exercises and to claim so is just a misunderstanding. Okay, so... What I'm getting at here is that you cannot divorce the Hindu religion from the practice of yoga no more than you can separate communion, for instance, from the body and blood of Jesus. Uh. And I'm going to get back to this at the end, but uh. I want to point it out now as we move forward. Because, listen, the Bible tells us that there is, the Bible tells us that unworthy communion, if you take communion from an unworthy place, that can actually bring a curse upon you. So what does that tell us? It tells us that you cannot separate the spiritual vine from the spiritual root. So yoga is no different, okay? Regardless of your subjective intention, there is still an objective truth that you cannot bypass. 
And so yoga is literally idol worship and divination. It is its own religion. It is a form of Hindu prayer. It is a form of union to Hindu gods and goddesses where the patron god is Shiva, who, by the way, is the Lord of Destruction. We're going to talk about him in a little bit. And this cannot be disputed. Okay, regardless of how you feel about the practice or what your intentions are, this cannot be disputed because respectfully facts don't care about your feelings. And so this is a matter beyond the Lord knows that your the Lord knows your heart, okay? Because you just simply cannot eradicate the intrinsic design, definition, cultivation and curation of the yoga practice. So um Brian, I'm going to pass it over to you right now if you want to talk a little bit about the history of yoga from the context that you're going to have us look yeah. through the lens of. Absolutely. Yeah. So first off, there's some things to to contemplate about yoga. It's like number one, yoga is not just stretching. Okay. It's not just stretching. It is it is a religious practice. Okay. You can stretch and just stretch. Okay. But when it comes under the context of yoga, it is it is a ritual. It is a ritual, just like you can eat, just like I love that you brought up that, you know, taking communion, like, right, you can eat, but when you're taking communion, you're taking communion, <laughs> like, and so, like, in the same context, like, intent is sort of a um, component to a lot of things that we do, but unfortunately, demons don't care about your intent when you're doing, when you're giving them what they want, you know what I mean? Like, so many people say curse words, and you're like, oh, I didn't mean to say that. And then all of a sudden these things happen. Like you bring curses upon yourself and you do these kind of acts when you're doing this, demons don't care about your intent. That's why they manipulate words. And there's a lot of words, wordplay that like sounds like one word, but it's really, really similar to another word that sounds really negative and bad. Like that's because mm -hmm. demons know they're, they, they get by with your emotional heart and uh, an evocation of a word out of your mouth. And that's enough for them to, to claim rights over your life or to claim invitation into what they're doing. So in the same sense, yoga, it, like it does not matter if you're coming under these titled positions, um, you know, it's very clear that you're, you're participating in a type of ritual, whether you want, whether you mean to or not. And so um, that's number one thing that you have to like kind of get out the door. And so, and then you go, well, do I want to be participating in this ritual? You know, let's say I'm doing it for exercise and funsies, but we'll get into that later, I'm sure. But, you know, like if you want to participate in that ritual, like let's talk about where it comes from. Okay. Because you're not just participating in, in exercise, which is a form of self-worship in a lot of ways, but you know, that's not what's really happening. What's really happening is let's talk about the truth of what you're, what you're participating, because the Bible actually says that you know, we're called as Christians to hate even the garments stained by sin, right? Mm. So mm. the Bible says to hate even the garments stained by sin. These garments of yoga have a lot of stains. That's what I'm going to tell mm. you right now. And when you start looking into it, you're like, oh, oh, maybe, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't be doing this ritual practice that pays homage to fallen angel Nephilim demons. So let's get into that. So Pata Julie is uh, obviously one of the, the patron people, the author of the yoga principles, he is called. And um, you mentioned him earlier. And uh, he's literally an, a serpent. He's an ancient serpent deity who is said to have uh, supposedly taken on the form or the possession of the serpent creator god, which is uh, Shesha. And it's also called a Ade Shesha, I believe is what it's also called. And so Adi Shesha is this ancient original serpent. Okay. It's an original serpent. And, and you find these thematical things throughout history where it's like, oh, here's a serpent again. Oh, why is the serpent always involved in all these evil things? You're like, uh, because duh, it's satanic. Like, but you know, we can, we can try to pretend that it's not. <laughs> and so uh, regardless, when you look into it, there's something else to be considered that I think people need to get into the basis of actually, I forgot, I should mention this. There's Buddhism, there's Hinduism, and there's Jainism, okay? And there's these three sort of things, like combine these three religious bases, and they're all involved in yoga practices, if you will. And you'll see the people sitting in these weird, you know, seat leg poses and have their hands up doing these little hand symbols and, and mudras. But these three base religious perspectives kind of filter in all this yoga knowledge 
And something important to mention is Buddhism kind of practices on focusing on nothingism. And it's actually a lot of Buddhist practice are actually ripoffs of what Jesus taught. Surprisingly, they like kind of steal the principles and it's perverted our worldview to be like, oh, when you see somebody that acts like Jesus, you think he's Buddhist. Um, but that's something yeah. totally indifferent. And when it comes to um, Hinduism, we pra- there's a lot of many gods that they're practicing, right? And this is, you you know, you know, Brahma, the creator God that they that they claim is the one in control, right? But when it comes to Jainism, which is not as prominently known, but actually more influential in this understanding of this of the yoga practice and all these things, Jainism is like Hinduism, but it's got 24 um, base like God creators that created this. And these base God creators are called the uh, Trithanakaras, I believe. I, I'm butchering how to pronounce that word. Uh, Trithanakaras, I believe is what it is. And it's their 24 creator gods. And they're all, they're called, and that word Trithanakaras, I can't even say it, um, means Ford maker. Okay, it means to cross bodies of water in, in one step. That's what a Ford means. Ford maker. So these were giant beings. Oh, doesn't, doesn't the Bible talk about giant beings that were fallen angels, the descendants? Yeah, it does. So these were giant <laughs> beings that created this religious perspective. They're called the Ford makers and there's 24 of them. You can look up all the stuff about them. And Jainism is actually derived from the Aramaic word. You get jinn. And what's a jinn? It's an ancient demon. Okay, a jinn is the Aramaic word for demon. So Jainism is jinnism. It's the same thing. It's telling you that these are the jinn, which were the giants that were the Nephilim fallen angels who created this ideology of worshiping them. And that's what yoga mm-hmm. principles and practices come into. They're basically paying homage and ritual, uh, you know, veneration to these fallen angel giant demonic nephilim gods and i'm sure you've got some images that we'll bring up and show yeah. here soon and you guys can see the, the similarities in them but basically this the the main consensus when you look through these historical accounts and you start reading about each one of these gods you're like dude this god is azazel who's a fallen angel in the bible like you can see the similarities between these gods and you're like whoa whoa th- why is this all line up because it's the same thing and so, and here's the crazy part, and this is, then I'll end it with this short little glip of understanding the history. But the crazy part is that to reach nirvana doesn't have to do with you. And so this is the biggest lie that I've come to find out through studying, um, studying this whole subject that's just like, you know, blow my perspective of this view way out of the water because these practices were, yoga was invented to be yoked with the gods it was not just to be yoked in peace it was to be yoked with the god that's why it's called yoked yeah. with like that's the term and so it's to be yoked with what what are the gods right and so nirvana there's a, there's a word it's called samsara okay samsara means the cycle of life and it's the mundane death and rebirth they say that exists but it's not death and rebirth for you it's death and rebirth for the spirits of the Nephilim, okay? Because this talks about their bodies dying and their spirits remaining on the earth, okay? So the whole principle of enlightenment and all these, you know, oh, Nirvana states, all of that has nothing to do with us humans. It had to do with the Nephilim gods, the, 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 the beings that created these practices and they invented the yoga practice for you to be able to help them achieve their nirvana state, their enlightenment and their rebirth through you. And so this mm. is this is like very deep when you get into like yeah. reading this understanding. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, the nirvana state is a, is emptying yourself so that you can be filled with the demonic spirits that lack their body. That's what's happening. So yoga is not a. It's not a principle of just stretching. It's a principle of worship to deities that you don't know, okay, so that they can find ways to be joined with you. And that is that is ultimately 
the sort of historical aspect of the Nephilim and the fallen angels, how it plays into this practice. Now, it boggles my mind as, a, as anybody that believes in Christianity or anybody that's a believer in God, like that would say, hey, you know, this is where this practice stems from. Hey, but we could use it for stretching, guys. Let's just stretch. Like, no, <laughs> dude, that's not what it's about. <laughs> so yeah. anyways... No, that's so good because it's that's what the devil does. He just deceives. So it's like you mm -hmm. kind of reform it over the years, especially as be this practice that's for you to achieve oneness and universal consciousness. Well, that's like exactly what the devil, these demons, this Nephilim would want you to think that it's for you. That's exactly mm -hmm. what they did. Yeah. That That's exactly what happened in the garden, right? He's like, oh, you can be like God when really what that was, was that was giving the enemy permission to infiltrate the garden by her making that mm -hmm. decision to sin. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it's the same thing here. Um, Nayla, is there anything you wanna add to that? How about, do you have any word for people that are gonna say, well, you know, the Hindu belief structure, these ancient texts that you're all alluding to, they all actually came before Christianity. <laughs> well, it links really well to what you just said about the garden, right? Because this is the oldest lie in existence. The first lie Satan said to Eve, you can be like God. You know, you don't need to listen to what your father God's told you. You can do your own thing. You can have your own experience of enlightenment separate from God, independently from God. And, you know, that fall from the true relationship we were always intended to have with God, that fall into sin is what created the pagan culture that is as old as the beginning of human history the pagan culture of worshiping gods, of worshiping the wrong thing. Right. So people who say, oh, well, technically the different scripts that we find for yoga are older, they're dated older, that it came before Christianity, before the publication of the Bible. It, it's, it's an old ancient practice of worshiping demons that goes back to the beginning. It comes from the fall. Like people have been sinning since we fell from grace, since Eve ate the forbidden fruit. So to say it's older just is, is a really non-argument because it's like saying just because people have always been practicing evil, that somehow legitimizes it. The fact that the Bible wasn't actually penned until later doesn't mean that God only suddenly started to exist once people were writing down the Bible. Like he created all of us and we fell from grace and started to worship false gods. So I always find that argument is a very strange way of saying that something has more legitimacy. It's as if you're saying that something wicked is okay if it's older than the official publication of, of the word of God. I just don't find it a valid argument, but I can see how the devil deceives people with that. Brian, you said something about that when we spoke the other day that I really liked. What did you say about that? Um, oh, well, I just said, you know, people will say, oh, but it's older. And I would say, well, yeah, that is like, of course it's older. <laughs> and like the reason why Jesus came was to fix what has broken. The fallen right. angels were being worshiped and the Nephilim were on the earth. God flooded the earth to fix what was broken. OK, right. like it, like he had been doing this all along. So duh, it's older. Like, yeah. right. Big it's like just <laughs> yeah, it's like just because we have been mm -hmm. doing the wrong thing for a long time doesn't mean we should continue in it. Right. It's like yeah. worshiping idols and false gods is a violation of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. And so it doesn't change the fact that it's mm -hmm. it's uh, idolatry. Right. And yep. what I find interesting about all of that in in unison is that, you know, it actually lends to what the word says being so legitimized because all of this stuff, right? The, the, yo the ancient yogic lore and it coming from the Nephilim, exactly what Brian said, like that's why the flood happened because the world was being overrun by these hybrids, by these demons essentially. Mm -hmm. And now it, you know, it's, so it just legitimizes what we see in scripture. And I just love yeah. seeing the Bible prove itself true, but we have a lot of ground to cover. So let's move on. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the popular yoga poses because I get asked this a lot. Um, we know that this is essentially idol worship, pagan worship. You're creating an avatar with your body for Satan when you do yoga. There's no other way to slice it. Um, and again, Shiva is like the patron god of yoga. And like Brian said, he is... Like Brahman is the creator and then Shiva is like the God of destruction and rebirth. So he is the yoga God and the yoga practice, while it really is in oh. homage to him, 
It also pays worship to any of the 33 million Hindu gods and goddesses through the asanas and the vinyasas themselves. So accord, according to the ancient yogic writings, um, it's a it's a way to revere, connect to, and pay respect to the deities of yoga. And the postures, the yoga postures, they represent not only what the deity looks like, but also what they stand for. So practicing the postures, moving through the postures and the flow puts a focus on the energy and the essence of the deity, of the demon, we'll just call a spade a spade, to actually embody uh -huh. the qualities of this deity uh -huh. through, the pro through the postures. Um, and so it goes back to the definition of yoke, to have a union with. So in other words, right, just like the TLDR version, the yoga positions and the yoga sequences are acts of worship. And through those acts of worship, the energetic essence, the life force of the spiritual entities worshiped thus enter into the hearts and the lives of the practitioners. Like Brian said, it's the rebirth of those spirits through you actually worshiping and yoking to them. You are coming into agreement with these spirits. Again, your body is being an avatar of worship to pagan gods. And let's look at one of these actually commandments right here. Okay. We have Exodus 3.20 where it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is something the Lord takes very seriously. And I want you to hear me when I say this. He would not be emphasizing this if there weren't other gods to have. If those mm -hmm. little G gods mm -hmm. weren't actually right. there. If those little G gods weren't actually something you could yoke with, this commandment would not be so serious. But and it's not yoga... just before you. It's like it's like it's like people think like, oh, well, God's number one, and yoga can be number two because right. it just has to make God number one. No, when He says before me, it means not anything in front of me, right, or behind. Ooh, that's good. Me. It just means not even in my presence. That's what before me represents in that word. When you break that down, that understanding. And that's like, good. so yeah, anyway, sorry. No, that that's good. That's, that's good. To, <laughs> that's good to say. Um, but the point is when you, when you use your body as physical divination in the yoga practice, you are putting other gods before him, like Brian just said, and it's not the Holy yeah, spirit, by the way, right? It's not the Holy spirit. It's any of those other 33 million gods. It's for Shiva. It's by the way, mm -hmm. if you think it's all a myth, I want you to, again, just consider those linguistics, right? The, yeah other gods okay they and exist an, an, another thing about the shiva i mean like the it, shiva is always depicted with like a pitchfork and with a snake wrapped around him yeah so like and he's the god of destruction right yeah. and so like why would he all why would they all have the snake like what's the significance yes. of the snake always being tied oh, to yeah. these high level demons <laughs> and it's like it's very clear it's very clear that there's something unique there and i'll tell you one other thing like in yoga practice there's a lot to do with elephants in like the Hindu religion and elephant, just so you guys know, like the name God, like Mike L or Gabriel L, right? So L is a, is a conjunctive, uh, it's a, it's an ending adjective that means of God. So there's the Elohim, which are the other gods. Okay. Right. The Elohim doesn't mean God. Like it, it says God is the greatest God. He's the God above all gods. Like that's, it's silly to be like, oh, he's he's the only God and there is no other gods. Like he admits that he is the God of gods. So he, there is other things out there. There's other little gods out there, right? That God created yeah. them. And and obviously they're hijacking the principles of, of the worship that's supposed to only go to, to him. And that's the battle that we're seeing. But like, like he didn't say that, you know, because those other things didn't exist. He's the only, I'm the only, I'm the best basketball player and nobody else plays basketball. <laughs> like, it's just kind of ridiculous. And so, mm -hmm. but like, when you look at that, um, you look at that, that Shiva and you look at how that basically, uh, how he is and, and the connection to the elephants. And this is also very interesting. The word L means God, just like Michael is, uh, is messenger or warrior of God or Gabriel is messenger Elohim. of God. The word, yeah. And Elohim, the word font means to present it's, it's to present an L a font means to present the gods. So literally elephants, which, and if you watch even like Lord of the Rings, they say, oh, the elephants, like they even make an homage to these great massive elephant creatures. But like, if you look in Hindu uh, writings and temples and, and images, you see these giant gods 
riding mm-hmm. on the elephants, but they're so much bigger than than the person that you would see you're riding an elephant today. Like the people are the size of the elephants in a lot of these depictions. You're like, these are some weird, small, tiny elephants, or are they really big Nephilim-esque mm-hmm. God people that were mm-hmm. riding these things? And it's very, it's very obvious because the elephants were treated in historical accounts that we do find giants that they treated the elephants as horses and they rode them like mm-hmm. horses. And that was, that was how they were uh, carried around. And that's why the, the, the native people over in India worshiped the elephants because the elephants mm-hmm. were the carriers of the gods. So elephant means to present the gods. That's the, mm-hmm. that's where the, the name even it, it, it alludes from. Mm. And you so, even see that in modern day yoga, like in every yoga studio yeah. or in those yoga tapestries, people hang on their wall, yoga pants, like it's elephants, 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 all the ancient carvings, yeah. ancient drawings, it's elephants, because God is like, you know, the, the gods that are possessing the people doing yoga are saying like, present us, present the yes. gods. <laughs> yeah, they can be there carried through by the elephants. Yeah. That's crazy. Wild. Well, that's actually, that's going to be really relevant in a second, because we're going to talk about some of those gods in, in through means of the poses. Um, and I know one of those poses that I'm going to talk about is uh, homage to reverence to Ganesh, who is the elephant god. And we're going to show a picture of him. But first, let's talk about tree pose. I want to go through some of the very basic things that you see in your normal day yoga class. You know, there's so many yoga poses, but I don't want to show all the ones where you're contorting and like halfway up the wall and upside down and backwards. Like (laughs) these are like the very basic ones, just a couple of them guys. I just want to show you. So this is tree pose. Um, Okay. So this is actually, when you look into the context of it, what the pose represents, it is for this guy, or I'm sorry, this, this gal, she's apparently a goddess, goddess Sati. (laughs) So this is who you're yoking to. And the reason you yoke to her through this pose is you're you're supposed to do this pose and meditate on this pose. It's to channel her essence of determination and perseverance. So you're adopting strength from a pagan god, from a Nephilim. (laughs) She does look huge, by the way, and she's stepping on a skull. So there's that. Um, And then we have, I'm going to make this as brief as I can. Then we have dancer pose. Okay, so dancer pose is for Shiva, who we keep talking about, the patron god of yoga. It's an invocation of Shiva himself. So Shiva is known, as we have reiterated, the lord of destruction. And what he is known for is dancing on the ashes of corpses. I want to just take a brief caveat to that. Brian, can you tell us about the experience you just had with the deliverance with the god Shiva (laughs) really quickly? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I literally, so I prayed demons off of people like weekly, daily sometimes. Um, and I literally just had an encounter with a demonic spirit in, in a, in a girl that, you know, she was a dancer like her whole life. And, uh, you know, typically when I pray demons off people, you know, everything I do, it's in, it's in love and we do it in, in joy and in peace. And typically when we're praying against stuff, I'll be like, Hey, you know, if they've got a spirit of something, uh, I, I, I'll be like, it's usually depression or anxiety or fear. And these are the type of entities that we pray away, right? Uh, occasionally you will come across entities that have names. Okay. In deliverance. Occasionally it's not always, sometimes you'll come across uh, entities. Like I've prayed, I've encountered Bilzebub and, and Ashtaroth and a few different ones that, you know, and I'm always like hesitant to like say their name. Cause I don't want to like say something that might potentially evoke something in a person or, you know, or might put an idea in someone's head, but typically we just pray away characteristics, but this, this just happened. And I was praying for the girl and I was like, Hey, say I renounce these things. And she was renouncing stuff, fear and whatever. And I heard it in the spirit. I heard it's Shiva. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. So like, I'm like, I'm like, and I wait, I always wait when I hear things like that. I don't like, all right, Lord is, this is really what this is. He's like, it's Shiva. I'm like, all right. So I'm like, Hey, go ahead and say, I renounce Shiva. And she's saying, I renounce this. I renounce this. Totally, totally fine. I say, I renounce Shiva. Dude, her head just goes sideways and she gets the wickedest smile. Like, like this, like creepy. And like, and she just starts laughing maniacally. Like, and I'm like, okay, it's Shiva. (laughs) Like, Like, I'm like, all right. So like we had to pray this demon off and dude, she has like the craziest body contortions from this thing. 
And again, she was a dancer. So like her whole life, she had been, you know, doing these kind of like dance moves and like, you know, cheerleading kind of stuff and yoga. She had, but I didn't know this, okay, until afterwards. And so, and then afterwards I talked to her and we we got the demon out and she like was throwing up and everything. It was, it was gnarly. And then I was like, hey, like uh, I talked to her after I was like, did you do yoga? She's like, yes, I did a lot of yoga. I'm like, interesting. And she's like, I knew when you said Shiva, I blacked out, but I knew that's what it was. She like, she just was like, I knew that's what it was. Like, it was like, it was, it was there, you know? And so said Shiva and boom, like, and when you pray these kind of demons off of people, like these demons that enter people through yoga and through dancing, you're going to see like some weird bodily reactions coming out of these people. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and you'll see the, the reactions in these people, like it'll be physical. Not always yeah. do we pray demons out. And does it seem like a physical reaction? Like yeah. it doesn't happen with everybody. Some people just breathe them out and they just go out with your breath, which is something else that we should talk about. I think we're going to talk we about will. breath stuff, we right? Will. Okay. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. So yeah. And you, you just briefly, Angela, that was also your reaction, right? Very physical. Mm -hmm. When you got delivered from a spirit that you got from yoga, you had when all I, the contortions. When I got delivered from the Kundalini spirit, which we're going to talk about at the end, I was my, the serpentine motion with my spine and I, it just would not stop. Mm -hmm. And that one was very stubborn. There was hissing, there was snarl. It was really intense. My experience being delivered from the yoga demon specifically was extremely intense. And when you, when you study this stuff, as we are going through this, you see why, because these, these guys are no joke. Like these demonic mm -hmm. entities are no joke and i'm just gonna bring they're very back old up on the screen they're Look at very him. old demons very very like they've been around they're ancient beings they know yes. so much and mm -hmm. they really want bodies to express mm -hmm. through so yep. they don't want to give up give that up easily there's and actually the origin oh the, the or, <laughs> i was gonna say the origin of the word demon most people don't understand this but daemon the meaning of it means the ones that know so a lot of people wow. like th that's the word for demon guys. Like it literally means the ones that know demons wow. know stuff. Wow. Like people think demons are just like, you know, there to, you know, possess you and make you not have a good day. Do they know stuff? Yeah. Like yeah. that's literally their wow. definition yeah. for the, for their name. There's a reason scripture the ones says that, wise yeah. as a serpent. Um, so what we're going to talk a little yep. bit about Shiva at the end as well. He's mm -hmm. going to kind of come back into mm -hmm. this conversation as the patron God. There's actually a reference to him in Revelation, which I'm going to talk about at the end. So I want to get into war, the warrior sequence next. Um, so the warrior sequence is what it looks like. This is in in reverence to yoking to the God Virabrata. So the three sequences of the warrior, which by the way, different than a normal lunge, you have to contort your body and your hips in a way that doesn't even feel good to get into the warrior sequence. It's not mm. just a normal runner stretch for the record. So the warrior sequence here, it represents the three stages of this God's life and it illustrates the tale of his violent incarnation in one to the way he beheaded Daksha and slaughtered all the wedding guests. It's a long lore <laughs> tale behind that. And then three, mm. the warrior three is the reenactment of him putting the butchered head on a stake. So if you look at this picture of this guy, he seems like a really pleasant kind of, you know, cock guy you want to invite <laughs> over for dinner. Um, but it's just, it's just stretching. It's, it's just, just stretching. stretching, guys. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, like I want you to understand that when you go through this, because the warrior sequence is in almost every single yoga class or, or practice you're going to do, you are yoking with an out of control, mm -hmm. angry, murderous spirit that again, remember what it's mm -hmm. the purpose of it is for is to embody the essence of so this murderous spirit is literally contaminating your character let's move on to yep. half moon okay this is ganesha we just talked about him um ganesha for the half moon pose it, this is dedicated to he's the god who's depicted as the half human half elef elephant now brian as you were talking about mm -hmm. this elephant thing I, I found this fascinating when you were talking about the size ratio because when you look at Ganesha, you'll notice that the size of his body and his head are always proportionate. When you would think like if, a, if an elephant head was placed on a human body, because by the way, the story about Ganesha is that he was created because he was actually decapitated by Shiva and Shiva replaced his head with an elephant. And yet it's the same mm -hmm. size. So again, he was a giant. Ganesha was a giant mm -hmm. and then they put the elephant head. That's why it's been perfect proportion. And the story of why it... It's like a whole rabbit hole. You can go down to see why the pose is in homage of him, but that's another thing. And next we have 
goddess pose, which Nayla, I don't know about you, but goddess pose was my favorite because it's embodying mm-hmm. the divine feminine, right? This is goddess pose. Mm-hmm. Here is who goddess pose yokes you with. Doesn't she seem nice? This is goddess <laughs> Kali. So Kali is like the most intimidating goddess. She is the goddess mm. of destruction where Shiva is the god of. And I mean, she's obviously terrifying. Look at her picture. She is the goddess of death, time, and destruction. And again, she's known as the divine feminine. I remember when we would pull yoga cards and goddess cards, it was like, oh, I got Kali. It's like the yeah, one that you wanted she's most. She's like the ultimate, the mm-hmm. ultimate goddess. Right. And look yeah. at her. So she's like the, I ma- was, the mother of the universe. Oh, what do you have to share about Kali? I just want to share briefly because I was so mm-hmm. obsessed with Kali. So she was one of my favorite deities um always like highest up on my altar and um i used to chant in sanskrit and i would chant to kali for like hours and hours Mm. every single day and the intention when you do that is to meditate on her sigil and as you're looking at the image associated with her saying the words associated with her and welcoming her essence into you you do become like completely demonized i i did become totally demon possessed with that um that spirit you know and it's a spirit of of rage of chaos of just lust intensity it's it's, she's such a violent spirit as you see from that picture but yeah I used to like sit for five six hours a day chanting to Kali sometimes I would get in these trances where I would just chant and chant and chant and chant and um she also brings like an incredible heaviness definitely like brings on depression mm-hmm. if you're doing stuff with Kali. Mm. So, yeah. If you're it's if, very dark. If you're calling out by the way this just came to me I feel this is from the Lord. If you're calling out a Jezebel spirit that's not coming out, try Kali because they're very similar. <laughs> if the person's done yoga especially, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I prayed uh for a a girl that was actually named Kali. Um, and it was also a very, um, violent reaction that person had. Um, Mm -hmm. and it was like right in the be right in the beginning when I started praying for people. Um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty nuts. And all, all I did was just look at this girl's face and just, I, I, you know, pray with her and I just stared at her for a second and dude, her eyes just went rolled back in her head, went white eyed and just like went nuts, like crazy nutso. And so again, it was a very gnarly spirit that she had embodied, I think, from that same spirit because of her name. Her name was the same name. Right. Yeah. Thank God Mm -hmm. I got saved before I got pregnant because I would have named my baby after some crazy goddess. Anyway, let's move on. (laughs) No, I was going to do that too. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. So here we have the sun salutation sequence, which Nayla is also going to talk about at the end when we discuss a little bit about, well, what can I do instead? Um, so the sun salutation sequence is, it's like a series of 12 different poses. And ultimately the sun salutation sequence is in honor of Sura, the sun god. Now I want to address this because people always say when they think they're being cute and clever, oh, so what if I bend down and touch my toes, I'm praising a sun god. No, you look at the sequence, it's very intentional. You have to move through this rhythmically, okay? And the sun salutations, there's sun salutation A, there's sun salutation B. I don't want to get into the whole thing about it, but there is, there's a a rhythm to it. There's a sequence to it. There is a, a, a correct order to it. And then you marry it with a certain breathing technique, which we will discuss very shortly. But I just want to make that disclaimer. You're bending down, touching your toes. You're not going to get a demon, okay? Let's just <laughs> let's just throw that out right away. But this is who this the, the sun salutation sequence is. They pay homage to God Sura, and this is who you are channeling through it. Looks very beautiful, yada, yada. But, you know, ultimately, sun god, who was that an impersonation of? Let's think really hard about that. <laughs> uh, it's a counterfeit Jesus, obviously, because the the god this the god of the sun rather than the son of God, right? So, um, mm. I want to rate. I want to bring up another p- scripture, actually, in relation to that, because I'm sure you guys hear it too. A lot of the time, people will say, "Well, where in scripture does it say?" that I can't do yoga. And I'm gonna be honest, it doesn't say word for word, don't do yoga. However, it does say to have no part in divination, sorcery, idolatry, or polytheism or pantheism. Let's look at Deuteronomy 419, okay? It says, and beware lest you lift your eyes to heaven and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, 
you'll you be drawn away and worship them and serve them things which the wow. lord your god has allotted to the people under the whole heaven okay and then we also have romans 125 where it says they exchanged the truth about god for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever so even the sun salutation mm -hmm. sequence in and of itself again it's for the sun god so uh -huh. no matter you're how literally you bowing it, down you're literally bowing down and doing exactly right. what scripture says not to do so mm -hmm. it is right. in scripture not to do mm -hmm. yoga it's just not in those exact mm -hmm. words but when we let scripture interpret itself and we see the full context and we know the history of these things and we see the evidence portrayed before us we can conclude oh you know what this is actually not of god and i really shouldn't be doing this at all do you guys have right. anything and to even add just yeah i just wanted to say that even the act of doing yoga is as we're explaining to you guys it is ancient demon worship ancient demigod false god worship so yoga is a violation of the first and second commandment so if you're a christian and you obey the god of the bible it it's ludicrous to say well the word yoga isn't in the bible when the first and second commandment of your god is have no other gods before me do not worship any god but me that's what that means it like brian said it doesn't mean have me and then have other gods it means worship no other mm -hmm. god but me and so mm -hmm. right there is your very clear command not to do yoga like don't do any form of demon <laughs> worship and whether you think it's demon worship or not you can't deny that it's a hindu practice worshiping hindu gods as we've just given you some great examples of yeah and and i would say another thing is it says you know the bible says do not worship me in the ways that the pagans do yep. right mm -hmm. and um i don't know if you have that verse to pull up that but that one end, yeah Oh, okay. Yeah. Well then, you know, that, that, that understanding also implies though, that we're not to, a lot of people might be like, oh, well, it's about intention. It's about intention guys. Like I didn't intend for it to do that. Well, there is, you know, intention up actually that, that verse and that understanding actually goes against you. Okay. It actually doesn't go for you. It goes against you. Because there's there's the understanding that you need to honor the Lord your God and be righteous and not have skin or not have uh, clothes that are splotted by the flesh, right? Or stained by the by sin in any way, right? And so, and also beware of your intention. So that means like, let's say eating pizza was uh, a thing that is fine to do. Well, let's say you you eat it every day and you worship pizza, right? Okay, so now- Pizza for you has become your God and you're not to be eating pizza. I know this because this is actually true about myself and I've had to stop <laughs> eating pizza now. And the Lord's just like, Hey, bro, like stop eating pizza. And I'm like, I'm like, are you serious? Like, come on, like, you know, but like, that's the reality. So like, you know, your intent, it actually plays against you because it's, 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 you know, if there is an intent that, that comes in alignment before the Lord, your God, you got to cut it out. Mm. Mm. Amen. Amen. And I know we're going to talk more about intentions at the end, but, you know, to just go off what Brian was saying, God really cares about your intentions because he sees your heart. He's mm -hmm. a God who sees the heart, but the devil doesn't care about your intentions. Mm -hmm. He does not care. If you're doing yoga as a Christian and in your heart, you're thinking about Jesus whilst you use your body to worship Hindu gods, the devil doesn't care. He's just glad that you opened the door to that demonic spirit, mm -hmm. which can now come into your body and into your soul. Right. So it's it's really just it's a complete deception that Christian tri Christians can do yoga. There's no such thing as holy yoga. Yoga is by definition unholy. Amen. Mm -hmm. One more pose I want to bring up here because it segues nicely into our next point about breathing and invocations and conjurings. This is the lion's breath, guys. So oh did anyone, <laughs> does anyone in yoga remember this? Um, yeah. Doesn't yeah. make you look demon possessed at all when you do lion's <laughs> breath. So this is just, um, yeah, th this isn't necessarily like to channel a specific deity. However, you do lion's breath in the yoga practice as a form of pranayama. Okay. Because breathing is a core element of the yoga practice. And the pranayama, which is just yogic breathing, it refers to the conscious and, and controlled breathing matches, the, that matches, I'm sorry, the rhythm of the yoga postures. 
So often you'll start out the yoga practice with some sort of breathing exercise, alternate nostril breathing, or this sort of breathing, the lion's breath specifically, um, because the pranayama is supposed to invoke the life force. Pranayama is a Sanskrit word in conjunction of two words. So prana means breath or vital energy and ayama means expansion, regulation, and control. So it is the yogic art of breathing. It's deliberate modifications. Okay, so is breathing demonic? No, it is deliberate modifications of the breathing process. Mm -hmm. And the gurus of Vedic times placed great importance on pranayama and advocated its practice in order to unleash the hidden potential known as kundalini. So we're going to get into kundalini in a minute, and I'm going to take this really obscene picture off now. I just really wanted to hammer in on that. <laughs> Um, so the breath awareness that is achieved through pranayama strengthens the mind. It makes it easier to move inward. That's the whole point of it. And the expansion of consciousness and awareness is supposed to bring your brain into action and relieve the yogi from the stagnant mechanisms of life. It's, you know, getting back to that state of nirvana. That is the ultimate goal. Um, and the idea with, with the regulated breathing through yoga and these modifications is that so you can kind of control your emotions and the shat rupas, which is considered the six enemies of the spirit. So listen to this karma, which is and lust, um, krota, which is anger, loba, which is miserliness, moha, which is infatuation, mada, which is ego, and matsara, which is jealousy all through breathing are supposedly destroyed. So you're no longer slaves of the emotions. So what are those all sound? Well, that's the sin nature, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the practice of pranayama, it's supposed to lead you to a pure mind. So it's cleansing you of your sins for lack of a better term. And now, wow. yeah, isn't that interesting? So as you, as you do this, uh, this pranayama through the sequences of the yoga, through those poses that we just showed, plus a trillion other ones, it's to get to that samadhi, which is the moksha, which is the enlightenment. It's false salvation. We as Christians know what salvation really is. It's false salvation because it's popularly known as a bliss or a liberation of shorts. Mm. It's like the eighth and the final stage of what is referred to as the eight limbs of yoga. It's the stage where you have completely withdrawn from the outside world and connected to your inner world in the state of bliss. And that when you reach the stage, you're finally in the oneness. You have no perceptions of likes or dislikes. You have no judgments, no ego, no attachments. It's true liberation. However, it comes with a caveat. And the caveat is that it's not a permanent state. It's something that can't be achieved easily. It's something you always have to come back to. It can take years and decades to achieve. Like it's how exhausting does that sound right but it's the perfect mm -hmm. recipe to keep coming back and getting more and more demons mm -hmm. um and pantageli tells us that it's only when we're actually ready to be free of all these things that we can be free of them at all so the mind can be completely pure and be in the samadhi for some time counterfeit salvation and it invokes mm -hmm. that kundalini spirit that we're going to really get into toward the end here but it's like the point with the breathing ultimately is that it makes you righteous for lack of a better term, with the yoga practice. The pranayama is to make you righteous, to bring you into a state where you can actually receive the enlightenment through the practice of yoga. So it's like you're made righteous by the breath work and then through the modality of the asanas. Now, it's exhausting. And I just want to just quickly point out that Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. And also Amen. the pranayama stuff is literally channeling the life force energy and what I've found is how interesting it is that there are so many scriptures about God being the breath of life, where with the pranayama and the breathing exercises, the breathing modifications to marry with the yoga practice, it makes you responsible for the breath of your own life. So I just want to bring up some of those scriptures. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Job 33, 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty God gives me life. And then John 20, 22. When he said this, Jesus, he breathed on them and said to them, 
receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus literally breathes on the disciples to give them the Holy Spirit. God is the breath of life. Pranayama makes a complete mockery of God himself as the breath of life. And again, this stuff does not predate Christianity because God has been from the beginning. So what the devil has always done is counterfeit God. So we see the pranayama as the counterfeit breath of life. So I want this to mm -hmm. just really lead into what Brian has to share about incantations via breathwork and verbal cues. And then Nayla's going to take it from there. Yeah. So um, two things too, I want to, I want to mention when it comes to like that tongue pose. Okay. Historically, I want to mention something and then I'm going to mention something pertaining to um, deliverance. Okay. That tongue pose. Um, if you look up old drawings, you'll see the, like the Rakshasa's, and all these these creatures, they'll all all these supposed deities will always have their tongue sticking out. Okay, that is yes. a common. And there's a lion, like the lion on the crest for England, actually has its tongue sticking out um, to this day. And you'll see this, which evokes the lion pose. How fascinating! And so you'll see these um, demonic spirits or these entities or these things that animalistic things that always are representative of the tongue sticking out. OK, the tongue sticking out is a direct correlation to even like clowns. OK, it has to do with like clowns and stuff as well, which are connected to the Rakshasas and their tongue sticking out. But it's a it's a direct correlation to defiance of God. And now I know this is mm -hmm. going to sound a little bit out there and weird or whatever. But when God created everybody, he gave us prophetic words to speak with our tongue and and like the tongue sticking out is almost it's like a declaration to demons that got access to tongues by possessing people. And they mm -hmm. stuck out their tongue to the Lord saying, look, you didn't give us the right to speak in this earth, but we got one now. And that was actually kind of what that stems from. Mm -hmm. And so that, that pose, that lion's pose is, is like literally saying the demon is, that's a bragging pose for demons. He's sticking to be his like, tongue out at God. Yeah. That's literally what you're doing. And it's, it's a defiance, it's, it's rebellion and you see it throughout history. Okay. And you see it tied into all kinds of different things where you'll see the, the statues like gargoyles with their tongue out. Okay. Like all of that is a defiance of the creation of God. And it, and it's a, it's a recognition pose of something being perverted um, and something being uh, getting back. It's, it's right to speak and to prophesy into this realm. So right. that's. And we, you know, we worship the lion of Judah and here you have the lion's breath and it's, mm -hmm. it's the lion of Judah, Jesus Christ, who breathed life into us. So it's this really twisted perversion of like Angela said, that the breath of life that God gives and then referencing the lion, just like Hindus always worship the sun, but it's the wrong sun. It's not the son yep. of God. It's the son that he created. <laughs> so it's always that, you know, all the deceptive philosophies and false religions in the world will always give you like bits of truth mixed in with lies yep. just to make it confusing. Absolutely. And, and the other thing I will say when it comes to the breath concept in general, as a deliverance minister, um, you'll find that it's it, that I have to do this all the time for a lot of people. I don't tell people breathe in. I don't ever say that, but I will. I will tell people breathe out. I'll say, push it out with your breath, push it mm. out. And so this is something, you know, when we're praying for people to get the demon out, I'll be like, hey, just, you know, push whatever out with your breath. Just push it out. And people are like, oh, I thought be like, oh, oh, they felt like they felt it leave them. In yoga, it's always breathe in. Wow. It's always it's take it in. Wow, yes. And so it's totally the inversion of deliverance. <laughs> like you're literally and, and even the mouth open. It, I don't, you know, I don't fully understand it in the spirit, but I will tell you that the concept of demons, they leave through your breath. Okay. And the, the, the idea of bless you actually stems from this term because huh. they believe that when somebody sneezed, that was a demonic spirit leaving them mm -hmm. really fast. Okay. So wow. that's where the term bless <laughs> you came from. And so ironically, I've not seen someone sneeze a demon out. So I don't know if the sneezing is the, is the exact correlation, but, they but I do, out. they do come out with coughing. They come out with burping. They come out with, you know, choking, throwing up, they come out your mouth. And so yeah. like demonic spirits, you know, you'll sweat them out, you'll breathe them out. 
that is a very common thing that we see in deliverance. And so like, you know, as a deliverance person, I'll be like, get it out, bro. Just push it out with your mouth. Just, just get it out, you know? And so, but in the breath work, this is literally you're breathing in. And it's also connected to like hyperventilating. Like when people are hyperventilating, panic attacks, right? Panic. Exactly. It's, wow. it's your, your, your breathing in, out, in, out. You're like, <laughs> like that, that is evoking something. It's something trying to go into you. And I think almost it, having your mouth open like that and doing that lion's pose is almost like an invite to whatever spirit come into me. Yeah. And yeah. that's also a secondary part. It's of that. also, let's be honest. Let's look at this pose again. And just, this is perverted looking. And I said this to Nayla, it's basically mm -hmm. like you're, you're just like waiting for a demon to basically molest you. Like, I mean, and that mm -hmm. sounds extreme, but demons are perverts as well. And like the whole topic okay. about how sexual yoga is, honestly, we would be sitting here until midnight, which we can't do. That's probably a part two in getting into tantra yoga and all those things. But yoga is extremely perverted as well and something to know about the demons is that they're extremely perverted and if you've ever done yoga or if you do yoga i want you to really take inventory on the maybe sin struggles that you have or the temptations that you have because i would be willing to bet money and the bible says we shouldn't do that so i'm not going to but <laughs> i would be willing to bet that lust is a stronghold in your life and i can mm. guarantee that the yoga practice is why Okay. So anyway, mm. yeah, let's talk definitely. a little bit about those incantations and um, a little bit more about that. If you, if there's anything about verbal cues you want to talk about either of you, um, I know Brian had some stuff on that. Yeah. I think that leads on really well from the breath to talk about the um, power of invocation. Did you want to start with that, Brian? You, you go, you go. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, in, when I was a yoga teacher, I was, doing sound healing and I was doing vocal yoga. So it was all about using mm -hmm. the breath and the voice to invoke the essence of said demons. And I'm gonna talk later a bit more about chakras and body portals and how we let demons in through yoga. But as Brian said, one of the ways that we welcome them in is through inhaling. And then we use our breath, the breath of life that God gave us to actually prophesy and invocate certain spirits, um, entities. In yoga, they would probably say energies, but mm -hmm. energies, when you're talking about any kind of spiritual practice, when people refer to energy in the new age and the occult, we're talking about spirits. Mm -hmm. There's, It's not just energy as in like frequencies and vibration. These are actual demonic beings that you're connecting with. So if you're connecting with like a sensual energy it's a spirit of lust if you're connecting with like that rage energy of kali that's a spirit of murder or death so it's actually a, a personhood that you're invoking mm -hmm. um and yeah i would use the breath to invoke those demons and then sing with them at different mm -hmm. frequencies using the chakra system and i would actually hear angels singing with me i now know they were fallen angels the fallen angels of yoga but I would be able to use my chakras plus my voice, plus my breath to open portals in the spirit and hear these angels singing all around me. And I'd be harmonizing with them. And then when I would stop singing, I could still hear them singing. And I was like, mm. wow, I've like tapped into like this angelic throne room of like angels singing with me. And, you know, this is the thing, guys, the devil appears as an angel of light. He does appear as these angels singing with you, harmonizing peace, love, unity. These are the messages of yoga. But as we've just seen from Angela's slides, all of the spirits behind yoga are murderous, evil spirits that chop people's heads off and do disgusting, violent things. They're not spirits of love and peace. We never see them being depicted in the Hindu images in the ancient images they're never depicted like just holding a lamb like we see our savior <laughs> depicted they're always depicted with snakes wrapped around their neck chopping people's mm -hmm. heads off so like this is the real spirit that you're invoking so anyway i would see these angelic beings and i would hear these angelic beings when i would practice yoga and um yeah really thought i was singing with angels but now i know i was invocating using using incantation the power of the breath and the voice to actually open portals in the spirit realm and communicate with demons mm -hmm. yeah yeah i know one, you more, thing I want, one more thing i actually oh. wanted to add on as you were talking because i don't want to forget this point i need to put a picture of it and i should have um but it's pretty easy to imagine corpse pose 
Okay. Cause as Nayla, as you were talking, I was thinking about that. And I know we guys, we, the three of us discussed this on our like little briefing call. The corpse pose is what you end every yoga practice with. It's like the, it's like the closing move. And it's the one thing you look forward to because you're supposed to lie down and just be totally zen out. Right. So it's a corpse pose that, that we know what a corpse is. It's a dead body. So you go through all this stuff to channel all these demons, yoke with all these demons, mm -hmm. only to ultimately mm -hmm. die at the end. So you're dead at the end. And then what happens when you're done? Well, I guess that means you're reborn. But what's really reborn once you get up from that mat? What Brian Thank said you. at the beginning, right? Yeah, it's, it's that <laughs> spirit. So it's just really mm -hmm. fascinating when you break all this stuff down. And then, of course, we know we're going to talk about the ends, the counterfeits, but that's a counterfeit born again experience. So I wanted yeah. to, I wanted to say that before I forgot, Brian, what were you going to say touching off Nayla's point? Um, yeah. When it, when it comes to like evoking spirits, like people don't understand, but like those little chakra symbols that they put on there, like every one of those is a demonic sigil. And like, yeah. people don't know, like you don't write demons names with words, you write them in symbols. So yeah. like all that little, all those little symbols, all those little imagery, that's how you write a demon's name. Okay. And so you're, when you are in the presence of a sigil and you're speaking certain words or saying certain things and you're, you're breathing certain ways, or you're participating in certain acts of defiance. Yeah. Or being in sin and you're participating that you're, mm -hmm. you're inviting demons, like you're inviting demons doing this kind yes. of stuff. So absolutely, yeah. 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 I wanted to say like the power of invocation is something we see in the biblical faith of the biblical way to follow God is to pray to him, to sing to him. There's power in his name. We, we use our breath and our words to invite his Holy spirit mm. because we just want to commune with him. Everything in yoga, that has breath, praise the Lord. Uh -huh. Everything that has breath, use that breath to praise the Lord. And in yoga, you are literally praising demons with your breath, worshiping demons inviting them in. I would like to give a really disturbing example of that. So in every single yoga practice and in every yoga studio, you'll start the yoga session with the word Om, right? You'll chant Om. Um, so chanting Om yokes you to Brahman. We mentioned him at the beginning of the line. Bra Brahman is the head demon or creator god of Hinduism. So when you sit down and start your yoga practice, you literally say the name of the head demon of Hinduism. You you call him by his nickname, which is Om, and you yeah. welcome his spirit into your body. So mm -hmm. in Hinduism, they say that Brahman is the highest universal principle, right? He's the creator God, and he's the ultimate reality. So you sit down and the first thing you do is pay homage to him, to that false God, welcome him into your being, um, another example of that is namaste. So when people say namaste, namaste literally means the God in me bows to the God in you or the divine in me honors the divine in you. Um, and this is just ridiculous. We're not divine. So who do you think this is talking about? Humans are not <laughs> divine. Humans are humans. We're not divine. We are eternal beings, but we're not divine beings like angels are. But the fallen angels are divine beings. And they love to talk to each other through your mouth. Even in the yoga studio, they bow to each other and they talk to each other. So I've got an example here of the namaste prayer in English. The namaste prayer says, I honor the place in which the whole universe resides. I honor the place of love, light, and peace. When you are in that place in you and I am in that place in me, we are truly one. Namaste. So you hear like the confusion there. There's another voice speaking about the place in you that they're also in. This is a demon. Mm. Um, so this is the way that voice is used, even in the most basic yoga class, your breath and your voice is used to call demons, summon demons, conjure demons and welcome them into your being. Mm. That's so good. Yeah. The, uh, you know, something else, uh, I think there's, is it Om Namah Shivaya? That's like a chant that that's also pretty mm -hmm. common. Yeah, yes. there, there's a lot of different chants that that are kind of they use Om as the springboard of. Yeah, and so I think the that one the uh, Shiva Ya it's interesting because they say Ya and Ya still means God, mm. and so it's literally saying Shiva's God, and you yeah. when you recognize it, you're like literally saying, 
like nah like shiva's my god and you're evoking that and and you know going into to that sort of acceptance of of all that and another thing when you when you talk about a lot of these principles uh they sound really good on the surface okay they sound like oh no violence okay no right. violence don't harm anything right when you get down to why that actually means this like there's a uh i'm trying to remember what it was but uh, i was reading through some stuff that was talking about the ultimate practice of of people that try to reach the nirvana state through denial of self in all these ways right and so uh through yoga and these practices and such uh i looked at the list and the top there's like five main denials of yourself and then there was like a list all the way down to like 26 something denials of self and the very bottom of the list the main ones they they were like deny this deny that whatever and then the very bottom was do not bathe do not brush your teeth <laughs> like literally it's like do not do not wash your mouth or brush your teeth do not bathe do not wear clothes because you denied everything that you own so like what are we painting the picture of here like a non-bathing <laughs> naked person that literally <laughs> it doesn't and de if, deny yourself food it says deny yourself food and sleep on the ground on hard surfaces so when you look into this this is like no rest no peace no joy uh -huh. suffering and uh, and like self demonic possession like you're straight like it's describing a naked wild crazy man is what it's describing and you're just like <laughs> this is what it means like denial of yourself they want you to deny yourself to the point where you're naked they want you to have uh you know deny food to the point where you're starving and and suffering you're not enjoying life at all they want you to deny uh any kind of comfort to the point where you're sleeping on a floor that's hard surface Okay. They want you to deny your, your desire for till you're naked and exposed. Okay. Like this is literally the ultimate goal of a lot of these things. And the reason why no violence even exists, no violence to any creature, because the demon spirits existed in creatures. And at that time, okay. people knew if you saw something that wasn't fully human, you were like, that's a demon. And so it promoted nonviolence because they're like, no, 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 don't kill those things. Don't kill the demons. Right. Don't kill the demons. That's, we want them to stay around. So that's where the whole concept of nonviolence came from. It wasn't nonviolence between humans because the, the, the people obviously had went to war and the Hindus murdered a whole lot of people in these, kind, in these situations. So like, it wasn't about nonviolence to humans. It was about nonviolence to the creatures specifically, to mm -hmm. the creatures, to the animals, to, the, to these things, because they didn't want you to kill the hosts that the demons embodied into. That's what a lot of this stems from. Anyways. Right. And these these spirits, these unclean spirits, mm -hmm. these demons, they hate you. They hate human beings. So like that description of how they want to just basically break a person down is actually what's happening. Even if you're currently in the kind of temporary bliss of yoga that I had at the beginning, mm -hmm. um, where the, the, the demons of yoga that you actually yoke with when you're doing the practice will temporarily lift off you and give you bliss, give you relief, give you false peace so that you get addicted to the practice. But most people who are practicing yoga, if you actually look into their life, they're struggling with depression. They're struggling with anxiety. They're struggling mm -hmm. with self-loathing and lust. And that's partly why they're doing yoga every day to try and still their mind and deal with that anxiety. But it is the yoga practice that is actually funneling the demons, giving you the anxiety into your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. So you are addicted to the very poison yes. that's destroying you. I can and totally this is why we're sharing this because you know we 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 love you. We don't know you, but we love you. Mm -hmm. We we know that God loves your soul and we don't want you to be yoking with demons. We want you to be yoking with the one true source of life, the, the mm -hmm. God of all creation who gives peace and gives joy. Yeah. I call I all the time I always say that yoga is a spiritual narcotic because it truly is you become addicted to this cycle where you find that you cannot get through the day without doing the yoga practice and even still even when you get through your yoga practice I mean for me I was still a mess it was the only thing keeping my head above water and just barely was it doing so yeah I was so dependent on doing yoga every day and now it's so obvious as to why because there was no other mm -hmm. physical practice, by the way, there was no other exercise, quote mm -hmm. unquote, that I was as dependent on as I was the yoga practice. So namaste away from that. Um, <laughs> no, now, stay now away. I want to I want to segue into meditation a little bit here, because I know we get asked all the time. Well, what about meditation? Mm -hmm. And I thought this would be a good way mm -hmm. to kind of 
talk about that on the surface because there's a lot about meditation. The more I dug into it, the more I realized just how extensive it was. And I will do an episode on this in the future. But meditation is by and large a part of the yoga practice because you are mm -hmm. intended to empty your mind through the practice of yoga. Why? Well, because of everything just aforementioned. The intention is to empty the mind so that you can unionize with a higher state of consciousness, with source, with these gods, okay, to awaken the kundalini spirit, to travel up your spine through your chakras and ultimately achieve this enlightenment, this nirvana, this moksha, this sadimi, whatever you want to call it. But that has to come first with emptying your mind. So what I wanted to do was go through some scripture on meditation, because this is really fascinating. We have Psalm 119, 11, where it says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. And so Psalm 119 specifically has a lot of information, a lot of information about meditating. And this is why, because the purpose of meditation in a biblical context is to ultimately store the word of God in your heart as to not sin against him. It's not to empty your mind. It's actually to store the Lord within. And then we have Psalm 119.15, where it says, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. 